A symphony in full song is many things. Racing 2 is a symphony, one of color, speed, and daring. Like great music, it stirs the soul. It's led by the great masters. And as with any performance, it is carefully planned and executed. An intricate combination of skills. The great artists each add their special moment to the play. The greatest appear casual, even at the most difficult parts. The maestro controls the elements of the score, just as the drivers conduct the combined play of many. Beauty, splendor, grace, and a never-ending quest for excellence. All of these things are embodied in the PPG IndyCar World Series, which today performs among the Rocky Mountains in Denver. The Texaco Haviland Grand Prix is a symphony about to begin. Mountains is a backdrop. The Indy cars are ready to race in downtown Denver, Colorado, in a circuit that passes right in front of the State House. Hello and welcome to the Mile High City. I'm Paul Page. Last time we saw the Indy cars was on the Super Speedway at Michigan International. Now, this is a tight, temporary circuit right in the center of the city. And as we come here, we have a most interesting points fight. Now, remember, there are 21 points available in this race 20 to the winner and one for leading the most laps. As we take a look at the points, we see that Bobby Rahal is way out in front. In fact, even if he doesn't finish in the numbers today, he can't be headed in the points fight. But Michael Andretti is most definitely on a charge. And Sam Posey, he is without question the focus of this event. Yes, he is. On Friday, it was announced that he had signed for another year in the IndyCar competitions, thus ending the possibility that he might make the jump to Formula One. Now, when this happened with Al Unser Jr. last year, when he made a similar decision al then went on to win four consecutive races and wrap up the championship will this happen with michael this year it's hard to say but yesterday he put together one of the best qualifying laps he has ever had in his career and took a point away from his arch rival bobby ray hall well, the circuit here is 16 turns, 1.9 miles. Bobby Unser, as I mentioned, the city's a mile high. Well, Denver is over 5,000 feet high in altitude, Paul, higher than any race that we run. The density altitude, which is the combination of high temperature plus the altitude, is approximately 8,000 feet today. Now, this means cooling problems with the water, the oil, and especially the brakes. The mechanics have had to increase the cooling capabilities approximately 15%. And remember, most of the drivers come from sea level. This could be a big factor in the race today because the altitude will get to the drivers too. Well, the engines have already been started. In fact, the first of three parade laps have been complete. And the cars are ready to race here in Denver. So let's take a look at the starting grid. On the pole, Michael Andretti, he's won four of the last seven races. And Bobby Rahal, the current points leader. The second row, Al Unser Jr., the winner of this race last year. And Emerson Fittipaldi, who won on the streets of Detroit in June. The third row, Mario Andretti, who just signed a new two-year contract with Newman Haas. And Eddie Cheever, his best starting spot since the season opener. The fourth row, Ari Leyendijk, who won at Phoenix in April. And Rick Mears, he swept both 500 milers this year. The fifth row, Scott Pruitt, his eighth top ten start this season, and Danny Sullivan, who ran second here a year ago. In the sixth row, Scott Goodyear, the talented young Canadian, and John Andretti, the winner of the first race in Australia in March. The seventh row, Willie T. Ribs is back, his best starting position this year. And Roberto Guerrero as well, driving for drag racer Kenny Bernstein. In the eighth row, it's Scott Brayton. He has four straight top ten finishes. And Buddy Lazier from nearby Vail, Colorado. The ninth row, Didier Tays making his sixth start this year. And Jeff Andretti, the leading candidate for Rookie of the Year honors. In the 10th row, Ted Prappas, a freshman out of Los Angeles, and Tony Bettenhausen, who ran a strong fifth three weeks ago at Michigan. The 11th row, Hiro Matsushita, sophomore from Japan, and Jeff Wood making his fourth.
fourth, 1991 start. In the final row, Randy Lewis, a veteran from Hillsborough, California, and John Jones from Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada. That's your lineup, the starting field, as we're ready to race here in the downtown Denver, Colorado. The main straightaway, the start-finish line, is right in front of the state capitol building a most scenic course not particularly fast but very challenging for these drivers of the indy cars johnny rutherford handles the ppg pace car in front of the starting field now this is the the pit area you can see the state house in the background the pits are actually removed from the start finish line they're around the corner just before the last turn so a very different circuit and add to that the pits here are also curved in fact a double s curve creates the pits here in denver colorado so the field working its way now in fact past the pit area under several of the overpasses created here and the pole sitter Michael Andretti will bring the field to the line. You're on board with Michael's brother Jeff Andretti. We'll be following his progress throughout this run as well. The final turn. Michael Andretti and Bobby Rahal sit in the front row. The green flag comes out from Nick Fanaro. And Michael Andretti takes a nice protected line into the first turn. Rahal comes up to challenge. It looks like Mario Andretti got bumped. He definitely got against the wall as the yellow flags come out. Also, Emerson Fittipaldi it appears is in there, as is Ari, Ari Leyendijk. A minimum That's of Rick five Mears. cars affected by this. A minimum of five cars. It's hard to tell. It was Rick Mears that is sitting there alone, not started, on board now. We're looking from the cockpit of Mario Andretti, so we can try to assess right away whether he suffered any suspension damage. Bobby, the car looks pretty clean. Yes, it does, Sam, yes. but you know, it's the biggest strung out field, or the longest I've seen the field strung out at the start that I've ever seen, so the guys weren't ready. Now, he definitely got something. His, his right front tire, suspension is bent. You can see the wheel go down there, locked up. He just couldn't turn. Notice, of course, that was the replay, the flat spot on the uh, right front tire of uh, Mario Andretti. Well, Mario definitely saw something. Let's focus on his cards. Third back in that line on the left row. Mario Andretti was looking at something. Apparently, he saw the move by Cheever. Yes, Cheever came over to the right, and Mario yanked the car away, locked the brakes immediately because it put him on course with the wall. If he'd only had a foot or two more, he would have been fine. Cheever, Fittipaldi all got through, and then Rick Mears stacked into the back of Leyendijk. The rest of the field got through, but as Bobby Unzer has pointed out, there is uh, really a question about whether or not Mario can continue. Bobby Unzer, let's watch again in slow motion. There's regular speed. There's Mario. And you can see Paul just locked the brakes really fat, hard and fast. You can see the flat spot on the right front tire. He bumped the wall, but ironically, he didn't hit it very hard. Not as hard from the slow speed as it looked like in the beginning. I didn't see anything obviously bent there. We'll certainly check on Mario Andretti. Ari Leyendijk is getting a little help from the kart safety team. And the race is under a full course yellow brought out right in the under full course yellow, the field continues to circle around as a result of Mario Andretti's accident on the very first lap. Let's go down to the pits, get an update from Gary Gerald. Paul, a couple of things we need to address early. This race is 10 laps shorter than it was a year ago in the inaugural version. Cart has dictated that this must be a two-pit stop race, even though at the shorter distance the teams could conceivably make this in one stop. A mandatory second stop must be made. You must change at least one tire or hook up your fueling equipment. Now, with that little incident on the first lap, Rick Mears has already been in the pits. Eddie Cheever has been in the pits. There, could, there was no damage that we could see. They got back out, but they've taken care of one of two mandatory pit stops. While it wasn't a popular ruling with all the teams, we think that most of the teams will take advantage of that second stop to get fresh tires because tire wear is a consideration. And for more on that, let's go further up pit road to our colleague, Jack Aroot. Gary, you can take strategies and you can throw them out the window today. Most of the drivers and crew chiefs say it's a seat of a pants race. Not because of the two pit stops, because of tires. It seems that the tire is a harder compound here this year than last year, but the problem is it only lasts for about four laps. Then they go away, and they only last for about 20 laps. So many of the crew chiefs are concerned that they won't have a sufficient tire left at the end of the race. So even though you could have gone on one stop, Many people feel that that second stop that was made mandatory may benefit them by being able to change tires. Not the case with Chip Ganassi's crew. Eddie Cheever, they planned, regardless, to come in under the first caution. They attached the fuel vent hose. They say, we've got our mandatory stop out of the way. We're going to try and go the rest of the distance on only one stop if the tires hold out. 
And once again, the definition of the pit stop is to attach the fuel hose or to change a tire. Indication is Mario Andretti, you're on board with him now, has some loose body work and a little damage to the left front. Right front suspension, Bobby Unser, looks pretty good. It certainly does, Paul. I don't think he's got any problems. Like I said, he didn't hit as hard as it first looked like he did. Here's a guy that's down a lap. Our Lion Dyke, he sat there with a dead engine, couldn't get restarted. Once he's he got did, a long way to catch up. Once he did, he slid into 24th or last place. Mario Andretti will restart in 23rd position. No cars out of the race as a result of that. Rick Mears, as noted, made a quick pass through the pits. They took a look at the nose, made what changes they could. Carl Haas certainly wondering about the condition of Mario's car, and his hopes for the moment are pinned on Michael's car. Now, this is Michael's. The, the difference for these onboard cameras is you will notice Michael has a great deal of white on the cowling around the cockpit. Mario's will have some black paint in the area up there around the cockpit. So we'll try and help you along, but we need the help as well. Mario, of course, uh, announced that he would drive for the Haas, Newman Haas team for another two years, so his career very much invigorated by that recent decision at the same time that Michael said he would sign for next year. Mario obviously hit uh, from behind to trigger that incident. You see him now. The pace car has already pulled off into the pit area as the field circles in front of the pits. And one more turn, a right-hander, and they should see a green flag once again, assuming they're lined up and the starter accepts the positioning. And we should be back racing. We are, in fact. So the Texaco Hamlin Grand Prix of Denver is back underway. No cars out of the races as a result of that first contact, but what it has done is strung the field out just a little bit. Eddie Cheever pulls up there to try and make a little move on John Andretti, and the rest of the field, for the most part, comes through single fire. Michael was very concerned with riding with him here uh, when I talked to him day before yesterday day about Ray Hall's ability to keep these tires alive. Jack Root mentioned the tire wear issue. Ray Hall has a very good setup in his car that does not overheat the tires as, uh, as much as in Michael's car. So Michael may try to pour it on here in the early stages to get what of a lead he possibly can over his rival. Now the temperature is hot here in Denver. Temperatures into the 90s, though a clear sky overhead. Bobby Unzer, they're actually facing several problems. You already mentioned the altitude problem and the fact that there isn't a lot of air getting into the brakes and the coolers. But we also have the problem of high temperatures and surface differences. Asphalt, concrete, and that's what's going to wear the tires. Look at Fittipaldi as he locks that right front coming into that corner. What you find mostly, Paul, is that the sun is shining. If we had clouds overhead, everything would stay fine. The 90 degree temperature would be no factor at all. It's the clouds overhead. Makes that pavement just really hot and slippery because it's the radiant heat that does it. You watch the ammo sliding his tires going in. He just doesn't have his brake balance set just right now, but partially because the sun's shining on the track. Michael Andretti leads, Bobby Ray Hall, then Al Unser Jr., Emerson Fittipaldi is fourth, Mario Andretti is being shown high up in the lineup on the computer, but we doubt that situation, we'll check it for you. And Al Unser Jr. moves inside of Bobby Ray Hall, and Al Unser Jr. now has second place. So the Gallus team already moving very quickly here, and Al Unser Jr. recognizing that if he is to have any place at all in winning this race a second time, he needs to move early. Al Unser Jr. did not do very well on Friday in qualifying. He did a bit better yesterday, and he has shown now that all that time through qualifying, he was pursuing a race day setup, not worried about qualifying time so much. He obviously has that same kind of terrific race day setup he had here last year and earlier this year at Long Beach, two races which he won decisively. I imagine as uh, Michael Andretti sees him in his mirrors, he may be very afraid of what he sees. Confirmation accurate. Mario Andretti runs in fifth place. Six is Scott Pruitt. Scott Goodyear is up in seventh place. John Andretti is eighth, and Eddie Cheever is ninth, followed by Danny Sullivan. Michael Andretti, without question, as Sam Posey suggested right at the start, is the man to catch here today. He has finished second to Ray Hall in championships in the past. He does not want to have that happen again. So now, four laps are complete here in Denver, and Michael Andretti has led through the first caution. We're back to racing. Since of Lion Dyke, a much faster car as Lion Dyke ducks to the inside. Back at the front of the field, Al Unser Jr. chases Michael Andretti. They come down into the what should be up. Michael is trying to hold off Al Unser Jr., but little Al is 
pushing as hard as he can. They come beside the pits now, making a quick curve through there, and little Al is right on top of Michael Andretti. Into the final turn now. Nice long straightaway just ahead. Michael Andretti has led from the green flag through the first caution, but Allinger Jr. was able to move up as soon as the green flag came out the second time. Now he's right at the back of Michael's car. Allinger comes to the inside. Michael tries to protect the line. And boy, he waits to break until the last second and then turns in, and Allinger Jr. takes the lead. It's it close to a wreck, Paul, because you can watch Michael getting ready to just get over there and block him a bit. Almost a touching there. Let's go down to the pitch, Jack Aroot. Paul, the biggest concern that Rick Ellis had before the start of this race was that his driver would go to the front too soon. He said, I need to keep a bridle on both my drivers because we don't want to wear the car out. But then I asked him, how do you do that? He says, with little Al, you just have to wait. He dictates the pace of the race. Obviously, there's not a bridle in his mouth this afternoon. Al Enzer Jr. going just as fast and hard as he can. That pass of his was an identical pass almost to the one at the end of the long straight at Long Beach this spring when he also passed Michael Andretti for the lead. A race in which, of course, Little Al went on to win handily. Now the fight becomes one for second place as Michael Andretti trying to hold off Little Al's teammate at the Craig Gallus operation, and that is Bobby Rahal, the points leader. Now we've got to remember, Little Al is out of the lead, pulling away a little bit. To Rahal, this becomes very important. The tires are going to get worse. They're not going to get better. Passing becomes harder. The worse that the tires get as compared to sticking on the racetrack. So Ray Hall has to push very hard to Michael now. If they don't have a yellow flag, he could be in trouble if he gets held up. And at the same time, Emerson Fittipaldi is set up to try and attack Ray Hall any time now. Well, consider the championship position, too. Ray Hall, of course, leads the championship by the big margin that you described at the beginning of the show, Paul. But he can afford to finish second or third today. So he may be just a little bit cautious. Michael Andretti basically is in a must win position, as is Al Unser Jr. So we're going to see all day long not only a race waged in front of us, but a championship battle with all of the strategic implications that go with that. As a matter of fact, Ray Hall could win the championship quite simply by keeping Michael Andretti in sight in front of him through the rest of the season. But of course, that's that's not really the way Ray Hall would ever play. Ray Hall loves this situation, but they're both attackers. You know, Ray Hall, a great student, of course, of military history. We're talking about it with Bob Sterling, our great advisor, this morning, and he said, you know, when you think about it, these are like General Grant and General Lee. They're both attacking men, and uh, they're not going to give it up uh, just because they're not going for the lead. They're thinking the championship, too. At the same time, Michael Andretti may be driving with greater style than he ever has in his career. He has really been outstanding. I spoke to him the other night at a ball they held here to the benefit of the Heart Association. I told him he, I was sorry because he was going to miss a ride in Formula One this next year. And he said, don't feel sorry for me. I, I love what I'm doing. And look how well he's doing it now, though Al Unser Jr. runs in front. Well, of course, the negotiations for the Formula One ride, among other things, allowed him to have some leverage over this team, probably sign a very long large dollar deal, which uh, he is not adverse to uh, doing, but also to demonstrate that he is a key element in this team, a really a, a man, the kind of a really driving genius around which a whole team gels. So Michael Andretti leads at the battle of second place between, or Alan Jr. leads at the battle is between Michael Andretti and Bobby Rahal, with Emerson Fittipaldi closing in, as well as Mario Andretti. We've mentioned how the altitude here in Denver forces these teams to make changes for this race. Danny Sullivan tells us about the altitude's effort in our tips from the cockpit. Well, of course, the biggest thing here is we're at 5,300 feet. Uh, that's higher than we race anywhere else. Uh, one of the major problems is the heat with the car. Uh, they overheat because it's got a, water has a lower boiling point at altitude than it does at sea level, uh, by about 30 degrees. Um, compounded with the fact that we're on a short, tight track, so we're never getting up higher. I think the fastest we go is 150 miles an hour, which sounds a lot to people out there if you're driving down the freeway, but 150 miles an hour to us on a, on a circuit is not very fast, plus the fact that we only get that one place, so we're not shoving much air through the radiators for a very long period of time to cool everything down. So on the cars, you'll see a lot of of uh, areas where the behind the radiators where it's cut out bigger to get more flow through the radiators to cool the cars down. You'll also see bigger brake ducts on the front and the rear because the braking here is so hard and it tends to boil the brakes a little bit easier up here 
and there are so many short straightaway short stops quick on the brake I think we're only averaging under 80 miles an hour as our lap average that's very very difficult on the brake so cooling is probably the major consideration here in Denver well Danny Sullivan just pitted and in doing so he fell from 11th to 21st position Eddie Cheever as he challenges John Andretti this is a fight for seventh place. Willie Ribs should be coming off that corner just behind this battle as well. So fights up and down the field in second place and also back here at seventh on the streets of Denver, Colorado. John Andretti, remember, won the very first race of the season in his first drive for the Hall BDS team. So he's a proud driver who is looking for his second run. On the other hand, Eddie Cheever in that black and red target car, well, he hasn't yet scored his first victory in the Indy cars and is, in fact, anxious to do so. Paul, well, let's just remind people of one thing. The card has mandated two pit stops for this race, whereas some of these cars could have done a little bit different game plan and done it with one. Two pit stops. So the game plans for the entire race are going to be a little bit mixed up or a little bit not understood until we get towards the latter part of three-fourths through the race, and then we'll have a better feeling. In fact, there was some indication that there was dissatisfaction. Scott Goodyear comes into the pits, and in doing so, they take the cowling off the car. So this is a lengthy and a most serious pit stop for Scott Goodyear. Some of the teams were very unhappy with what they felt was artificial meddling with the rules, enforcing two pit stops, when in fact, many of the teams felt that the cars could complete this race on one. The battle continues for second place between Michael Andretti and Bobby Rahal. There comes Fittipaldi through, who seems most pleased to just wait station. And just back from him, Mario Andretti runs in fifth. DC Sports. Michael Andretti continues to run in second place. And at the front of the field, it is Al Unser Jr. Now, we are thus far 11 laps deep, Gary 13 first. laps deep in this race. And here is a great fight for seventh place between Cheever and John Andretti. Mario Andretti tapped the wall in the very first corner of the first lap. And in doing so, they brought out a full course yellow. When they came back to the action, Michael Andretti led. And then Al Unser Jr. was able to get past Michael. And Michael fell back to second place, now being chased by Ray Hall. This is John Andretti being chased by Eddie Cheever. Nice little fight here. Cheever made one of the first of two stops that he's going to make. Now he's going to try and run inside John Andretti. John pulls wide. They get together and they touch. They touch. John Andretti is sent spinning. And Eddie Cheever moves on. It's inconceivable to me, Paul, that John Andretti did not see Eddie Cheever starting by him on the inside. Well, Sam, I think what you're going to find, or what we saw there is the fact that Cheever was up alongside. He really had the racing line. Yeah, and John Andretti has some serious damage. The nose is off the front of that car, and the question is whether or not the brake lines are damaged. Let's go to Jack Aroot. Well, Paul, let's update you on several other drivers that have had problems befall them. Scott Goodyear, with a severe water leak, has dropped out of the race. They're continuing to try and bring the car back. Danny Sullivan. Now, we talked to Pat Patrick and his team, and they said that they have got a severe handling problem, and they are not sure where to even begin to attack it. They don't think it's tires. They think they've gone totally the wrong way And chassis. Gary? Jack, we've got problems for another of the front runners, Emerson Fittipaldi, reporting problems with his braking. That was a concern for everybody. They think it's the rear brakes, but Roger Penske, Chuck Sprague, and the team here indicate they're going to try to leave him out to handle the course as best he can, as long as he can. But braking problems for Fittipaldi. Paul? Well, Bobby Enzer, some of the things that you most definitely predicted there, brakes again because the air is not dense, even though you see, if you look at the back of Emerson Fittipaldi's car, inside the rear wheels is well as the front some very large scoops that direct air down onto the brake discs and pads it's still really not enough at this altitude now on the rear brakes get the hottest Paul. what happens is is that the brake fluid boils and it only boils in half of the system there's two master cylinders one for the front one for the back the back ones are probably boiling the fluid not having the brakes and that's the reason you're watching locking up the front when he does the battle continues in second place as Bobby Rahal tries everything he can to worry Michael Andretti. One car stopped on the course. That's Didier Taze, the leader card entry. Taze has been running most of the road courses in this machine this year. And he's over off the racing line. Shouldn't be a danger there. No indication why that car may have stopped on the course. 
most accomplished driver. Here is John Andretti back in the pits, and you see they have already fixed a new nose on the car. Here's Jack. Well, Paul, what they had to do is completely replace the front end. The nose section was sheared off right by the brake cylinder, by the brake reservoirs. But with the new design of these cars, you actually can replace the wing and the nose cone in one full piece. They completed that entire operation in a little less than two and a half minutes. Well, John Andretti back in the fight, and look at this. John Andretti comes right out with his combatant of earlier, Eddie Cheever. And Cheever is closing in on Scott Pruitt in what now is a battle for sixth place. Now, John Andretti most certainly is not part of the fight because he's fallen way back through the field and is, in fact, running 23rd right now. But he is still with this battle with a nice, fresh nose on the car. Remember that Cheever's experience in Formula One running forces like Monaco stands him in very good stead on these tight courses. He finished third earlier this year at Long Beach. He is obviously having another strong, strong day. They did some testing here at altitude during this week, or earlier this week, at a small track near Denver. It's obviously paying off. Okay, also keep in mind, though, Eddie Cheever, the man right there we see in the picture, was the guy that pushed Mario Andretti into the wall at the start, the first turn. So Eddie is, uh, was a little bit hot on that first aggressive. turn there, Sam. <laughs> He's aggressive. He wants to make it all happen very fast. He's a guy who's basically underachieved so far this year. They've gotten some testing under their belt. They want to make it pay off for them right now. Cheever smoothly around Pruitt. Now John Andretti wants to try Scott Pruitt. Remember, in Cheever's car, Chevrolet power, but Judd power in Scott Pruitt's machine in a car design. Here, boy, look at that. It's Michael Andretti. is battling once again with Ray Hall. We'll get back to the Eddie Cheever situation. Michael Andretti and Ray Hall are at it once again. This is incredibly volatile because, of course, these are the two major combatants in the championship. Ray Hall leading uh, uh, Michael Andretti in the championship, but behind him here is a, put, he's in a position to be very conservative. He is not being conservative. He is trying to press Michael Andretti into a mistake and get by him. And Bobby Unser, we're seeing two slightly different lines out of these drivers. Yes, you certainly are because Ray Hall is getting the air disturbed just a little bit following Michael, but what you can see because he is so close to Michael all the time that he's actually handling and working a little bit better, so he's just waiting for Michael to make a little bit of a, sma a mistake. He's not able to outbreak him so far, though. Alan Zer Jr. is the leader. This is the battle for second. Alan Zer Jr., the defending champion here. Yeah, and of course, it's an ideal situation for the uh, Craco Gallus team because they've got their uh, man, Al Unser, way out front, which means means that Michael Andretti cannot pick up that bonus point for leading the most laps, which he has picked up five times during the season so far this year. Local driver Buddy Lazier now up to 10th place. He's never had a top 10 finish in his career. He's got a lot of fans in the stands here from Vail, Colorado, his hometown, rooting for him. Well, he's come a long ways in motor racing, and he really deserves a lot for being up in a 10th place with a field like this, Bo. Bobby Rahal knows, of course, that should a passing maneuver take both these cars out, and here Rahal's we go. going to try the maneuver, and come Michael right over to try and get in front of him. He does so. He blocks Rahal out of the corner and maintains second. You now, know, a deal like that, you can just flat see. Bobby Rahal is using good common sense. He was afraid he'd get an accident. The points right there are worth more than the pass was. Now, that is the, the act of a very smart race driver. Very nope. disciplined driver. That's Sandy Andretti, Michael's wife. And you saw that the safety vehicles on the course and waving yellows in that one section, as well as the white flag there, which tells the drivers that there is a safety vehicle head. They're trying to get Didier Tays off the course. Of course, if Ray Hall and Andretti were both eliminated in the same crash, that would actually help Ray Hall vis-a-vis -vis the championship in terms of his battle with Michael Andretti. But if Al Hunter Jr. goes on to win the race, he's currently fourth in the championship, he would vault up and become a contender. So caution is still a factor here. The battle for second place now moves around Jeff Wood as Ray Hall continues to stalk Michael Andretti. And this will become a most fascinating battle now because they are beginning to overhaul the back of the field. And in doing so, on a circuit as tight as this is and surprisingly slow as this is, if you want to regard 70 to 125 miles an hour as slow, well, the timing to the corner with other cars who are running slower than you there, that can be critical. You know, Ray Hall watches her husband. You know, Paul, another thing we got to watch, we watch Ray Hall chasing Michael there. And it's difficult to follow a car around the course like this. You can't judge because of the cement wall so much of what the other guy is doing, plus all the heat's in the exhaust and everything. Here's Ray Hall going to make a shot again. Oh, 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 the two of them get together. Both the 
the combatants in the fight. Michael Andretti frustrated with that when the engine appears dead. Jeff Wood pulls to a stop just behind him. The corner workers trying desperately to slow any oncoming traffic Everson down. Fittipaldi involved too. Fittipaldi right there, but he got going again. Yep. There goes Dad. Mario Andretti through, and Michael is looking for an opportunity to roll out. Emma got blocked. This is the one thing that should not have happened. It, Ray Hall really had to pass on Michael right there. Michael just pinched him into the wall yeah. too tight. Now, I, you know, you know, well, it's Ray Hall. Ray Hall. Ray Hall's going. Ray Hall got going. Michael's trying to get going. Apparently having trouble getting it. Now it's under power, and Michael is rolling again, but Ray Hall definitely got the advantage out of that one. A decisive moment in the championship, because certainly to turn the tide, Michael Andretti had to win this race. He's not now in a position to do so. Bobby Unser, here it is again. Now here Ray Hall is, trying to outbreak him, coming in the turn. He has plenty of room. Now Michael can see way over there. Ray Hall is more than up alongside of him, more than even. Michael just came right on down. There was no place for Bobby Ray Hall to go. They're going to be lucky if it doesn't knock both of them out of the race. Emma Fittipaldi, right behind the number five car, gets blocked. The total road is blocked right there. But you know, that's the same place where John Andretti misjudged uh, Cheever's presence there. Here's the leader, Al Unser Jr. Of course, his job made a lot easier by what has just happened behind him on the road. But that's where John Andretti had trouble, too. And it makes me think two drivers of that caliber are not uh, lulled into an easy error like that it must be very difficult in that turn to see the man inside of you for some reason now let's take a look at just exactly what he sees and doesn't see michael's on board camera as he comes into the corner at this moment ray hall is maneuvering to the inside and they get together and in fact as you hear the revs come up that tells you that michael's rear end got off the ground and the rears spun up and the engine got up to some high rev. Well, he was also shifting. He didn't, obviously, he didn't know that Bobby was going to hit. He was shifting and revving the engine up to get going again, Paul. This is Jeff Andretti. That's Michael's brother, of course. And the 31 car of Ted Prappas is stopped as well. So a good number of changes occurring here. Ray Hall was able to come out just behind Scott Pruitt, which put him into sixth place. And Michael Andretti is now behind Willie Ribs in eighth place. So a change in the order, as Sam pointed out, potentially a change in the championship. And look at Michael. He's flat at the left rear tire. He's going to have to limp around to the pits, and that can cause damage. Well, not only can cause damage, you can beat everything up in the car, Paul, but it's going to cost him precious time because he has to get in with that tire. Now, it's going to give if Bobby Ray Hall is not bent. Remember we said they're going to be lucky if there isn't something wrong. He's also dragging the bottom of this race car. It's going to really tear the race car up for Michael to get in, but this is what you call desperation time. He has to get back in the race, otherwise no points. Now as Michael goes through corners, the right front comes off the ground. He can barely steer the car, and he's just trying to limp his way around, find his way into the pits. And, and look, you'll see that what happens when he makes a turn in there, he gets on the brakes, and the wheel with no weight on it in front will lock completely up. He's only halfway around the lap, too. He's still got a ways to go. He's got to get down by the convention center, which you see in front of you there, make a couple of more rights before he can double back to the pits. Every foot is damaging that car. As I suggested, when you go into a right-hand corner in the weight transfer, well, with the back end, the whole chassis off a tilt, so when that, he hits the brakes, that one's going to yeah, lock on Yeah, that's because the suspensions are so incredibly stiff on these cars. This would not happen with a regular passenger car. The tub is really so stiff that the suspension is just falling down on the left rear. We see the right rear, right front locked up on the car. The main thing, though, is what we don't see is it's wearing something out on the bottom. We can't see that. The pit crews will have to look at that when he comes in. Bobby, what about in terms of a tactical mistake as now he makes it onto the pits? Here he's involved in a contact accident, and he doesn't. Well, Ray Hall didn't either come into the pits to give him a chance to check it. Is it just that the fight was so solid? Yes, it was. They were both just holding that as long as the engine runs, you can shift it, you look in your mirrors, you've got two tires on the rear, two tires on the front, that's all you really worry about. All right, let's go to Gary. Now, Paul, we get our first look as we lean out over the wall with a very anxious crew, the man who has led 39% of all the laps this year in the IndyCar season, shaking his head in disgust. All he can do is wait. They've got him down off the jack, they changed tires, and he is gone. He'll try it. They had suspension parts and everything ready. They didn't have to change them this time. Just a tick under 14 seconds, and Michael Andretti is out of the pits. But let's remember just how much time he lost trying to get that wounded machine back into the pits. It certainly has taken him out of the top of the order, if not out of the championship fight. Al Hunter Jr. continues to lead.
qualifies ninth. He's never finished in the top ten in an IndyCar race. And, of course, Sam Posey, he's got a lot of friends down from Vail that are certainly cheering him on. You bet it. While Scott Brayton, who you see here behind him, is, of course, a seasoned veteran, this is a really big day for Buddy Lazier, not only because it's near his hometown, but because he's running higher up in an IndyCar race than he ever has before. And he's a guy of great potential, finally being able to show it. And remember, he doesn't have near the ho horsepower that, that you see right there in the Amway car of Scott Brayton's, but Buddy is local. Don't you always see, Sam, that the local guys are a little bit harder than the guys from out of town? Yeah, his dad, of course, a very fine driver, all the way behind his son here, and I just hope here's a guy who can get going in the big leagues of racing. And both there. he and his dad, competent skiers, they run a lodge up at Vail, and you couldn't ask for nicer people, which is indicative pretty much of about all the guys in racing. Scott Brayton trying to catch up. We take a look up. This is a fight for third place. Cheever moves inside of Mario, and John Andretti is set right up behind there. He's not part of the fight, but the fight continues on as Eddie Cheever tries to cry and carve his way up through the field and now Cheever is into third place behind Fittipaldi and then Al Unser Jr. is the leader John Andretti still trying to work his way up through the field but since he is in 20th place he has a great deal of ground to make up but he has to do that Paul and the reason is is if he could just get it up ahead a yellow comes out or something happens like to Mario hey he could jump up 10 positions so fast it wouldn't even be funny Take a look at Mario's car because he does seem a little bit off the pace. Bobby, can you see anything on that car? Remember, he was involved in contact. You got the wing flopping loose, but I wonder if something else now hasn't developed. Well, it could easily be bent a little bit, but you must remember now, the wings here are very important. The tunnels underneath the race car do very little because of the low speed of the race. Scott Brayton gets past Buddy Lazier as Buddy gets a little bit off the line under braking. May have been, in fact, losing his brakes. I started to say, Paul, that the tunnels underneath the car, the ground effects part of these cars, don't do an awful lot because of the slower speeds here in downtown Denver. The thing that works is the, is the wings on the cars. Buddy Lazier trying now to get back around Scott Brayton, but look right behind him, the number one car. That's the leader of the race, Alan Sir Jr. Alan Sir Jr. started this race only 10 points behind Michael Andretti. As of this moment, with Al leading, he stands a very good chance of moving into second place in the standings ahead of Michael and behind only his teammates. So the Gallus team, may, the Craco team, may come out of this thing with an uh, arm lock on the championship. Al Unser Jr., who now leads by 27 seconds. Lazier got a glimpse of him in the rearview mirrors and quickly moved out of the way. So now little Al has to get around Scott Brayton, and he wants to do so very quickly carefully again because this is a temporary circuit it is lined with barriers and those barriers are totally unforgiving there goes Ray Hall as he battles with Mario and he goes past picks up fourth place Mario Andretti steadily falling backwards Bobby is it possible that whatever damage was done in that very first corner is now being aggravated we just don't see it yes it is the tires are getting hot the track is getting slipperier as the race goes on and that front wing is where his problems are and I don't really think that he's been on the front but we we must also remember, it wouldn't only take but just a little tiny bit of bending that wouldn't show up to cause the handling to be off. Some of the tire experts here at the track, like Jerry Brion of Penske, told me that one of the problems they are having here is with buildup on the tires. That's to say that uh, there are little particles of rubber that come off the tires as they wear, but then they're very soft and they get right back and adhere to the surface, and then you don't have anything. Look at the newspaper down in his cooler. Remember, high altitude, not very much density, and so as a result, that could cause some real damage. Emerson Fittipaldi is in. Here's Gary. And we're watching the Penske team go to work. They're concerned about rear brakes. Nothing they can do about it. It appears from this standpoint, a routine stop for rubber and fuel. Emerson is away in about 14 and a half seconds, Paul. Emerson Fittipaldi came in in second place and now comes out of the pits. May not lose too much as he comes back into the action. So Emerson Fittipaldi back into the fight in fifth position as he lines up behind Mihiro Matsushita. Emerson made the point to me this morning that this track has so many second gear turns. He's in one of them right now where the speed is only somewhere between 48 and 55 miles an hour, which for an Indy car is almost at a dead stop. And we also got to remember, these are literally 90-degree corners, corners on a street in downtown Denver. Real streets. They just came off Lincoln Boulevard, I think. A point, uh, perhaps, that we should make here, too, because we've heard a lot. Well, here comes the leader in, Jack Arruda's little Al's pit. 
And what Team Gallus has decided to do is evenly distribute their pit stops. They will take four new Goodyear tires all the way around and the remaining fuel that they have in the tank. Remember, as we told you, not necessary for refueling today. They'll be able to go to one stop, but they are off and away very quick. And a quick look at tire wear does not seem to be a problem with this team right now, Paul. Oh, wow, what a great stop. 13 seconds flat. He's in and out. Right now, this is the only car running in the top five or six for which we can perceive no obvious problem. He would seem to be in by far the best shape. In the best shape because he was able to get in and out of the pits and maintain the lead. Bobby Rahal is running in third place. Eddie Cheever runs in second. And these stops now, Bobby Enzer, are coming about where one would expect them. Yes, they decided the game plans were going to be like one-third, one-third, and then the finish. In other words, 24, 25 laps. And that's what they're doing. Of course, the yellow flags make so much difference if we have any. But other than early on, Paul, we've only had local yellow flags. So Al Unser Jr. has completed his first stop. Remember, Eddie Cheever in second place stopped very early on. Bobby Rahal has not stopped and is expected to do so shortly. So the first set of regularly scheduled stops of two, and two is not guesswork here because CART, through its officials, have mandated two stops in this race, despite the fact that some cars feel they could have done it in one. Yes, that's true. And I just was going to mention along those lines, as the cars are coming in now, don't need fuel. Fuel is not the problem. It's the tires. They need the tires because Goodyear came here with a very hard compound as opposed to last year's tire. And the guys just don't have a good tire that lasts very long. The tires get slippery. Now, the buildup that you were talking about a little bit earlier isn't quite as bad when you're up to speed. There's very little of it. It's when the cars slow down to come into the pits, the buildup looks like it's gross on the tires. But, of course, some of the argument uh, seems to be that because the top speed is only about 125, 130 miles an hour, that the buildup builds up very quickly and doesn't go away. Next Saturday at 12.30 Eastern ABC's college football season begins with an explosive matchup. Cotton Bowl champion Miami Hurricanes kick up some dirt when they take on the Arkansas Razorbacks. And then Greg Norman, Mark Kalkovecchia, and more tee off as we begin coverage of the Greater Milwaukee Open. That's all next Saturday here on ABC Sports. But one little more, more note on the build-up. There's, there's a lot of other types of cars that run on the track during this weekend. Mario Andretti is in the pits. Gary Gerald. And indeed, Paul, we're looking down to see that damaged nose wing on the left side. Mario wanted attention to it. They held him out gambling for a yellow didn't get it. They made a good stop. He's been soldiering with a heavily damaged front nose wing. He's back on so course. So Mario Andretti comes back out. Gary Gerald, if you're still with us, Gary, if, is yes. there any other obvious changes? We're taking a look at Roberto Guerrero's pit stop, but do they make any other obvious changes that might account for the very slow performance in the last few laps? No, and the scramble that we could see here trying to step around a couple of the crew members and stay out of their tangle of hoses, Paul, we could not see any other particular changes. All right, the other thing that one will have to be concerned with is whether or not that newspaper that got up on the left side cooler might have overheated the engine and caused some damage. So we'll keep an eye on Mario Andretti's car. Willie T. Ribs is now up running in fifth place. Allenser Jr. leads it, then Cheever, then Ray Hall, then Fittipaldi, and then Willie T. Ribs. Let's help, Paul. I just wanted to uh, mention real quick, the other classes of cars that run here, the Trans Am cars, the Firestone Superlights, all those cars leave rubber on the track. These cars pick up that rubber really bad. Sometimes if the compounds are not compatible with each other, it makes it worse. Surprise to me is that Ray Hall has not yet stopped. Here's Jack Aroot. Well, Paul, that is not surprising in itself, in so much as Bobby Rahal had elected to stay out there as long as he could. The only reason that he is pitting at the present time is due to a problem that they think they may have with one of the header pipes. As he went by several laps ago, they all realized that he may have a problem. They are going to go ahead and change all four tires. It has fallen down off the jacks. The air hose has come out, and they dropped the car literally down on the chassis. Things are not going well for Bobby Rahal. The engine has died. But they can think hear the was. silence. Jack, what they think it was? They a thought it was a, fault, a leak in the header, Paul. That's exactly the case. But they still wanted to persevere on. And now it's just a question mark as to what they will do. Well, it sounded like it. You could hear a different roar to the engine, which indicates that some of the exhaust is leaking out of that car. And so now, well over 40 seconds, Bobby Rahal has been in the pits. His teammate, Al Unser Jr., leads this race. This could be devastating to the overall championship fight. Though, again, as we said at the start of this show, Bobby Rahal cannot finish in the numbers here, and he'll still lead this race with the points championship, at least for the moment. 
At the front of the field, it's Al Unser Jr. Eddie Cheever is second. Emerson Fittipaldi is third. We'll be back with more from Denver. Just seconds ago, came rolling into the pits. That is a car. If it looks a lot like Masashita's car, it's because it is a car that was made in arrangement with Dick Simon and Derek Walker's team. Dick made this car available to Derek to run this race, and Willie's making every effort he can to stay at the front of the order and doing a fine job of it. Well, running in fourth place is not too bad. Willie doesn't have all that much experience, and I think that's a tremendous showing today, Paul. All right, let's go down and find out more about Bobby Rahal's situation. Here's Jack Aroot. Well, Paul, remember we first thought it might have been a faulty header or a leak in the header system, but according to Bobby Rahal, it was something far more serious. Yeah, it looks like a valve might have dropped or something broke because there's water coming out of the exhaust pipes. And uh, yeah, it was running good. We had a problem with the brakes. Um, you could see the fluid. You could see the fluid literally leaking out of the pipes. But this really puts a different twist on the whole chase for the championship. Back, back to square one. You know. And How bad does that bother you? I mean, you always say I take a one race at a time. Not much I can do about it now. You know, you just got to we'll have to try to win it to uh, Vancouver. Paul? Well, it'll definitely tighten up the points fight. If the race ended right now, Ray Hall would still lead. He'd have 141 points. Alonzo Jr., if he won it, will have 129 points. Michael Andretti, 124. Uh, so if it stays pretty much as it is right now, we're going to have a solid three-way battle for the championship with five races remaining in the series. In the second race in a row that Bobby Rahal has failed to finish, Al Unser Jr. continues to lead. Well, it's a shameful thing with Bobby Rahal, Paul, but even though you have a Chevrolet engine, which is by far the best engine running today, He's broken two of them this week, weekend, one of them in practice and another one today. And sometimes things like that make the decision on championships, and that's kind of sad. Well, shades at the start of the race, no, not nearly the same contest. Michael Andretti is sitting just in front of Ellinger Jr. Let's take a look at a comparison between Bobby Ray Hall and Michael Andretti. This has been Ray Hall's position throughout the year, and he has been incredibly consistent. On the other hand, Michael Andretti has not been nearly as consistent. Look at that. Up to the top, down to the bottom of the scale. Now Michael, with his problems here today, is running in seventh place. But the good news for him is that Ray Hall is out of the run. And so Michael now has a chance to earn some points on Ray Hall. How often that's called charging. Michael is the chargingest race driver of 1991. He flat gets with it, and he's done it all year. He takes more chances, but... Generally speaking, he goes the fastest of anybody this year. That very informative graphic, by the way, courtesy of Ann Roller, who's done our graphics all year. Really good job. All right, let's go down to Jack Aroot. Paul, the last time we were at an oval track in Michigan a couple of weeks ago, this man was challenging for the lead. Not today, Ari Leyendijk. What happened to your car? Well, I think the ignition box went out because it popped and banged uh, a few times and it just quit. And, uh, of course, until that point, we were having a pretty rough day, having lost a lap. Uh, you know, after the first lap, I had to go and avoid those guys in turn one. And the car stalled and they never could push me and start it again, so... What about the tight quarters here? As, as you look at the races, it's begun to unfold. What's your, what do you think about all of this? Is this a good place to race? No, I don't think this is a good place to race. I think it's very tight, very narrow. Uh, passing people is extremely difficult, even if they're a second or two seconds slower lap. Paul? Well, Jack Arud, what is a challenge to these race drivers is a magnificent venue for racing. Sam Posey, they're talking about as we watch this battle between Fittipaldi and Cheever. It's a fight for second place. And for the moment, they seem to be holding state. Oh, here comes Fittipaldi trying to get some air into his coolers. Sam, they're talking about moving this race out of the downtown next year. To me, that seems like it would be a tremendous loss to Denver. I second that. I'd hate to see it happen. A road track needs an identity. You might have great racing out in a parking lot, but nobody will ever remember it. And this track, of course, has the identity of the state capital. It runs right in front of it. You think of all the other great tracks around the world, and you always think of where they are. Monaco, Long Beach, India. Indianapolis. I, I know it's a lot of extra e effort to keep the track downtown. I wish, oh, Emerson. Fittipaldi oh. comes in. Cheever oh. wisely turns away from him, and Cheever moves back to third as Emerson Fittipaldi comes up to second. Well, that was a good and a close Whoa. pass. You know, and it's at that one place where a lot of the passing happens, but you can see that Eddie Cheever did not expect Emo to be there. Bobby, why does most of the passing happen right there in front of the State House on the main street? It's because it's at the end of a long straightaway. It's really wide. Let's watch Jim or Harry zigzagging back and forth, 
trying to get Sheaver to move to the outside, and now he's committed himself. He's going, now he's really committed right now. And then he saw that, almost lost it. You can see the rear end oh, wow. literally sliding. In fact, when he finally came back around to the left with the rear end, our right, the rear end was literally sliding almost to spin out, and he had to get back on the gas a little bit. A superlative little save by Eddie Cheever, though. Nice piece of driving. He could have been in much more serious problems. Well, that was a good pass. I just wanted to mention just real quick, there's Emil still on the charge coming up behind his teammate Rick Mears, but I, Bill Daniels, who promotes this race, owns this race, is a very close friend of mine. I was talking to Bill a couple of days ago, and he said he didn't really want to leave the downtown, but the politics are a little too strong down here. The race would probably do better on out south of town here. Wider roads, everything would be better, but Paul, it'll sure lose with a lot of romantic value that I think that it's always had to be in downtown. You saw Fittipaldi alongside Rick there for a second, Rick Mears after again that first lap situation runs in 11th the battle again here for fifth place as willie ribs and scott pruitt pruitt in the 11 car lined up just behind ribs here are two drivers the race against one another in the trans am for years and here is pruitt with his judd power trying to get inside of willie t ribs and he does so that's judd power against the cosworth but obviously that was a horsepower ribs thing. is you coming can... right back boy he was going to try him again this is a good fight well drive it in ribs just doesn't quite have the power that, that scott Pruitt does. You can watch when they come off. Pruitt will just jump ahead a little bit. You see right there, Pruitt is just pulling ahead. Both these men desperately need a strong finish for their season. Scott Pruitt started the year very strongly in this all-building America car, but the last four or five races have not been successful for him. There's a lot of controversy about what he might do for next year, who he will drive for. There's Scott Pruitt. You see him there in the box, and exactly what will happen may be the result of what happens just in the next two or three races. Same for Willie T. Ribs. He started the season season very promisingly but has not had a lot of luck up to this point he too needs a big finish I think some of the things we hear about for next year is going to be Budweiser are they going to stay with Scott Brook go there or will Ray Hall leave Rick Gallus probably the biggest stories today That finally they opened up the audio mic. Paul, remember during that aborted start when Eddie Cheever pitted, they connected the fuel hose? Well, now they are about to come in for what they say will be their final stop of this Grand Prix of Denver. The man that made the call, right here, Chip Ganassi, former driver and now the car owner for this team. They feel that they could be in good stead in terms of track positioning. Remember that most likely Al Jr. will have to make one additional stop. Not so for this team. They are about a half a lap away from pitting. Well, Eddie Chambers getting around the track pretty good right now. Of course, they have a game plan, and we also know that, that he's in second place. He can move up. He's waiting for little Al. Game plan by pit stops could make a big difference, and that's what Chip Ganassi is planning on. Eddie Cheever could look in a most excellent position as we keep an eye on him here. Currently running in third place behind Fittipaldi and Al Enzer Jr. Al Enzer Jr. having a very smooth day. By the way, the Ganassi team should be in great shape for next year as Eddie Cheever is all set to go. The team is pretty much in order and Cheever is very, very satisfied with it. Now, at the front of the field, it is Al Enzer Jr. And we see from the car of Mario Andretti, I don't know the view on the track right? and the skyline of Denver. Here is Eddie Cheever. We believe he is due very soon for a pit stop. You see him, he is having an extremely strong day, not since his Formula One days, where he scored second places on a couple of the road courses, including uh, Detroit, has he run this strong. Here he is into the pits. So Eddie Cheever is there. Here's Jack Aroon. Well, one of the things that we see also on Cheever's car, tires have not been a problem this afternoon. They've had a little bit of a difficulty changing the right rear, but they are completing the full tank, the full fuel load. They shake the fuel in there. He is off and away for the last time. They're not coming back, Paul, in 15.7. That's it for this group. A little slow, but in and out, they will not stop again as Eddie Cheever on the 35th lap has made his stop and comes back into the action. So the fight continues in Denver. We'll be back after this message and a word from our ABC stations. It's a most unique view. The rear wheels spinning back there as Jeff powers his way around this circuit. It also gives you a good impression of the acceleration. That's Rick Mears just behind him. Now Rick Mears runs in 11th place. He's made his second stop of the day. 
as has Eddie Cheever and Ted Pravitz. All of the other cars have yet a stop to make before the end of this run. Let's go down to the pits and Gary Gerald. Paul, oh, the concern over Emerson Fittipaldi early was with brakes. The brakes have cooled somewhat. The improvement apparently is there because Emerson has not been complaining about that on the radio. But the concern of the crew now is they're seeing a very steady and expected rise in temperatures relating to water. And that's what everybody had feared. And it varies in traffic. And maybe Bob or Sam can address how it changes when you get in traffic and you don't airflow into the radiators to try to cool down those temperatures. Bobby Unser? Well, one of the biggest problems is we don't even have a breeze today, and all the air sets down in between these two rows of cement, and each time the cars go around, it gets a little bit hotter. Another thing about the Penske cars that are different from the Lola cars is they use a heat exchanger, Paul, which is a way that the oil transfers its heat to the water, and the water transfers its heat out via a radiator. So a heat ex exchanger as opposed to an oil cooler with the Lola's. Now, if that doesn't make enough sense, I'll be glad to explain it more. But often, the heat exchangers don't run quite as cool. And here, on a hot day, temperatures in the 90s in downtown Denver, it makes a world of difference. And there is Roberto Guerrero, some blue vapor at the back of the car. It appears that that machine may be in trouble. He was running in ninth place when he last crossed over the start-finish line. And now he rolls to a stop in what most definitely would appear to be the end of the day. Well, it's a blown engine. There's no question about that. You can just see that smoke's coming out as both oil and water. The bad news that the driver doesn't want to know about. The yellow flag that you see waving there is for the local situation. It would not be a full course yellow, so we would not see a closing up. Al Unser, in other words, who you see here on the left of the screen, will be his lead will be protected by this situation. Alanzer Jr. runs out in front and has a solid advantage over second place Emerson Fittipaldi. This week, Alanzer Jr. will have an opportunity to test his brand new car, the Galmer chassis. We asked him about it. The expectations are, I hope, that it, uh, it runs quicker than the Lola. I think that's the first thing that, that we need to do, and, and the main reason why that is is because the majority of my competitors are in Lola chassis, and... and uh, you know, nothing is, is better than a mechanical advantage over your competition. And so uh, we strive for that kind of deal. And, and, uh, and now we've got the new car. Uh, hopefully it'll, it'll do that first. And then, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll see how the reliability is of it. So that new car, there's his wife, Shelly. The, the car is available to him. I suspect Bobby Unzer that Bobby Rahal's failure here today will affect some of that car's testing schedule because wouldn't it have been logical for uh, for Gallus to say, hey, let's use that car toward the end of the year once we're way ahead in points? No, they won't do that. They can't afford to. They've already shown it to the public and, of course, to the other racers to some degree. They can't let everything out on that car and show it around the racetrack. And it's going to take a while to develop it. It's very seldom that a car is good right off the bat, number one. Number two, just think how much Rick Gallus must have spent to have a try to give little Al Ray Hall of mechanical advantage. It's probably costing him many billions of dollars to build that car. Al Unser Jr. with a new car coming and no cheap. As throughout the field, there are some nice little fights. This one not for position, but Scott Pruitt just had to handle up Scott Brayton. And just behind Scott Brayton now is Buddy Lazier and then Willie T. Ribs. Willie Ribs is running in seventh place and trying to catch up to the sixth place Scott Pruitt. But he does have two cars in between himself and Pruitt as he tries to make up the position. At the front of the field is Al Unser Jr. He is being chased, though not closely, by Emerson Fittipaldi. Mario Andretti is up and running in third place right now. And there you see Willie T get past quite smoothly. Michael Andretti runs in fifth place behind fourth place Eddie Cheever. Then Scott Pruitt and Willie T Rims, a battle that is developing here and now. Well, it's a good battle, and you wouldn't tell any difference between that and a first place and a second place fight, Paul. But the race is not over. Still got a long ways to go. If these guys didn't race like that, they wouldn't look so good at the end of the year. And a lot of people, car owners, sponsors, everybody, are looking at these drivers right now. Especially like Buddy Lazier, they're right there. He's new. As they keep track of Al Unser Jr., 
in the Gallus Craco pits. The other story that we've started at the beginning of this show, and we'll keep an eye on Sam Posey, is Michael Andretti, who tangled with Bobby Ray Hall, had trouble getting restarted, had that terrible problem with his tire, but got going again. You ride with him now, and as you do so, you ride in fifth place. So Michael Andretti is trying to carve his way back up through this field and get as many points as he possibly can. If possible, perhaps he'd like to challenge Allinger Jr. for the lead once again. We're past the halfway point. 43 laps are complete. Allinger Jr. still leads. Black smoke, that indicates there's a fire there, and Sullivan ready to abandon the cockpit. He just had a stop-and-go penalty. He's trying to wave the fire crews over to give him a hand and get the fire out on that car. That's the paint burning. The paint first started burning, and now, of course, the body, the carbon fiber-type material in the body is burning. It's from heat, and when you stop it that quick, I may have blown an engine or something. We don't know about that. But when you stop that quick, the fire just goes, or the heat just goes right to the paint, and it just explodes with fire. So Danny Sullivan helps the firefighters protect his own race car. And, of course, the faster you get that fire out, the more parts in there. And since all those parts are real expensive, you want to get it out quickly. Well, Paul, ironically, the hood could cost them, it, it, you know, easily $20,000. So every second would count on that. It would pretty soon become a deal of dollars and cents. What an ideal moment is a full course yellow. Al Unser Jr., you saw the hoses out ready for his pit stop. Here is a break definitely in favor of the leader. Well, as they go full course yellow now, with Danny Sullivan's problem on the course, here is the man that benefits, Al Unser Jr., as he rolls down the pit road. And Al Unser Jr. has a solid lead in this race, a full 41 seconds over Emerson Fittipaldi as he rolls in now. The rest of the cars in the field taking advantage as well. The pit stop, it appears to be routine, an extra special precautionary check to make sure there are no debris in the coolers that are so critical here. Rick Mears is in the pits as well as he makes his stop. It is 16.3 seconds in and out for Little Al as he comes out alongside of Rick Mears. Danny Sullivan's car, totally disabled now, sits by the edge of the course, and that, of course, is the reason for the full course yellow. Well, we almost saw Rick leaving the pits again. Paul Little Al was passing Emerson Fittipaldi, and you could tell Emerson still doesn't have a lot of rear brakes because he locked up the brakes. The camera went away just right there. Danny's situation as we go back just a few laps and review it. Suddenly Danny came off the line and began slowing down. Sullivan, remember, with that Alfa Romeo power, and he got punched. Well, he did. He had no power. The car right behind him really didn't think that, that uh, he was going to slow down like that. And, of course, in anticipation of Danny accelerating, he accelerated and punched him a little bit. Any idea who that was uh, that uh, came up behind him there? I couldn't see it, Paul. Very difficult to tell. Nevertheless, you've got Danny Sullivan with one very expensive car covered now in uh, that chemical powder that helps fight the fires, and the cart safety team is there with a little extra light water on the car to make sure the fire is out. Often on road circuits, something like it'll happen, especially a really tight one like here in Denver, when you really kind of have to anticipate what the other driver's going to do so you can react to it. Otherwise, you couldn't stay very competitive with it, and that's what happened. He was coming off the turn, Danny lost his power, and kaboom, he punched him. But Danny already had problems anyway. Andretti, there he circles in third place now. The lineup under this full course yellow, and it'll take him a little bit for the field to gather up behind Johnny Rutherford's BPG pace car. Is Al Unser Jr., then Emerson Fittipaldi, then Mario Andretti, and then Eddie Cheever. Then Michael Andretti runs in fifth place. Let's take another look here, see if we can figure out exactly what happened. Bobby Unser. Well, you can just watch Danny going inside, but it looks like Rick Meals there. Rick Mears, and there comes the car behind him, which I can't tell by the color who it is. But right there, he just barely punched Danny right in the rear end. Didn't really, wasn't a hard hit, just a little bit too much. The car right behind us to the left now was still locking up his brakes an awful lot. Looked to be Michael Andretti that came up there so quickly. And the question of whether or not he actually touched Danny Sullivan, it sure looked like it from here. 46 laps are now complete of the 70 laps scheduled here in the Texaco Haviland Grand Prix of Denver. And Al Unser Jr. leads it. We'll be back after this message and a word from our ABC stations. Mexico cars, in fact, Michael Andretti, with just a smudge of black on the nose of his car, which could, in fact, indicate some contact with a car of Danny Sullivan. Now, this is the onboard camera. My 
illegal as he is chasing up, and you see he touched Danny Sullivan's left rear wheel. Yes, he did, and that mark we see on his nose is a little bit of rubber right from Danny's left rear tire, which really and all didn't hurt anything. It didn't hurt Michael, didn't bend anything, and certainly Danny was already out of the picture. So you don't think any damage there? No, there's no damage there. You can just see it. One little tiny spot got a little smoke. All right, one car that you may notice missing from this lineup is the number 14, A.J. Foyt's car, to be driven here by Mike Groff. And Mike Groff was involved in an accident here in the practice. A.J. had not entered his backup car, and so the rules prevented them going to the backup car and running Groff for another driver, though the medical indication might have been that Groff couldn't drive that car. But it also was a worrisome moment, Sam. Well, I think what happened, Paul, is, is that that they just didn't have the second car entered. Without the second car entered, they were able to tell Foyt he couldn't run it, so they couldn't do the thing. But they also said that if the field had not been full of cars, that he could have run the second car. Now, that looks to me like to be a little bit of contradiction of rule reading. And it seems a shame that, uh, especially a young competitor like Groff, trying to make a name for himself uh, with AJ's car, couldn't make it in. You see now the cars that are out of the field as we've completed our race summary here. And we continue to roll around this course with our second full caution of the day. And all of the cars in the field have now completed their pit stops. This is Michael. Let's take a look at it one more time. There he's coming up behind Danny Sullivan. Look at the smoke out of Danny's car. You can see he's just blowing his engine or something. They just saw an increase of smoke just on the left rear. That was when Michael's nose went right into the middle of his left rear tire. And again, it really wasn't a big factor or not really wasn't hurting anything. You know, you mentioned the controversy surrounding Foyt's car and, of course, the controversy about the two pit stops here at Denver and the moving of the track and a lot of other things. It's the middle of the season and a lot of uh, ill feeling is blowing around the pits. I hate to see it because I think this is a marvelous racing series with established stars, a great series of races all through the season, and I wish people would put a positive spin on what we're seeing. The field now trying to pack up behind the pace car led by the number one car of Alan Zoo Jr. He won this race last year. He's been spectacular on the streets as the pace car now pulls off into the pit area and Little Al picks the pace up with Fittipaldi right behind him and Michael Andretti running in third place in what should be a marvelous run to the finish now as the green flag comes out. Well, Little Al is in the lead. Fittipaldi's right behind. Now we know that Emerson doesn't have the brakes. Look at Mario Whoa. coming underneath him. Now there's nothing Emo can do on that. Mario was going to go on by because Emo has front brakes and he just can't help himself. So Al Spencer Jr. picks up the lead of the race once again. And sitting right behind him now is Michael Andretti. Let me just straighten that out, Paul. That was Rick Bears, but it was the same. He's both had both of the Penske cars have had rear brake problems, but Rick just wasn't able to get into the turn with Mario because of the rear brakes boiling the flood problem. Right, well, it's, it's not too difficult to become confused here because that is Michael just behind little Al, but he is one lap off the pace despite the fact that he runs back uh, in third in, uh, down in the order in fifth place. Let's go down to the pits now. Danny Sullivan has made it back. Well, Paul, we saw several parts of Danny Sullivan, part-time volunteer fireman and also the object of a drop kick. But you say that what we saw is not really what happened. Well, what happened was right before the corner onto the start-finish line, uh, my engine seized up, and I turned in there, and Michael was right behind it, and I, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't get out of the way, and I think he just, you know, punted me a little bit. I don't think it was anything severe. I barely felt it, but I was more concerned about uh, getting the car stopped, and I saw that it was on fire, was getting it out. Now, one of the problems, though, with this temporary course is all the chain link fence, and the corner worker had to run all the way back to get the fire extinguisher. Well, he had to go down to an opening to be able to get out onto the track, and uh, he could see what was going on, but he just couldn't get through the fence. Paul? Of course, that's one of the problems with temporary circuits as Michael Andretti comes inside of Al Unser Jr. and gets his lap back. So Michael Andretti now is back on the leader lap once again and runs in fifth place. Second place is Emerson Fittipaldi. You don't see him in the picture. He runs about seven seconds back. Be careful not to confuse him with the number three car of Rick Mears. They're very much alike, but of course Fittipaldi is carrying number five. Mario Andretti runs in third place 
race, and he is about three seconds back behind Fittipaldi. Yes, Paul, and plus he has an entire lap to come around to get behind little Al, of which, normally speaking, unless they have another full four shell, it couldn't happen, but that's the thing that makes it so interesting. We just had one full four shell, they could conceivably have another one. Little Al doesn't like to lose the advantage that he have had of having a full lap. Well, of course, if you would see another full course yellow, that would serve the advantage of Michael Andretti, who would come around Whoa. and the leaders. And Scott Brayton gets into the wall hard. A lot of damage to the front end, and this may be, I think, most certainly the that full course yellow. And Mario Andretti is involved. We're suddenly aboard Mario Andretti's car here, too. He was involved in that incident. Shaking his head in disappointment. Mario Andretti definitely involved in that one. Well, he's out. Well, there he is. You can Whoa. see it. The whole left front has knocked off his car. That's the reason he was shaking his head. He's definitely out of the race. He's had too many confrontations today for that car to make it anymore. The car this, looks so good when we can see only the right side. This is like a 24-man prize fight uh, today. Everybody has had contact with everybody else. But let's try to remember now that... Right. Take a look at this. Here is Scott Brayton. As he looks breaks ricochets off the wall and mario gets into him a couple of real hard hits for scott brayton boy scott brayton hit with his left Whoa. rear bounced right across in front of mario there wasn't a thing that mario could have done no matter what he have done it was going to be a bad collision and boy they shed a lot of parts off those cars there well mario climbs out of the car scott brayton is already out of his Let's try and take a look at this situation. Wait, look at the terrible damage on that car. Let's look and let's just listen to this situation. Two extraordinarily hard hits. Get go down through the order for you, but the critical fact here is the first four cars down through Michael Andretti are all running on the same lap. And yes, when the yellow came out for the Mario Andretti Scott Brayton accident, Michael Andretti was able to come all the way around and close up behind the leaders, bringing himself in fourth place and in contact with the leader of the race, Allenzer Jr. So with the few remaining laps that we have, this should be one whale of a fight. Allenzer Jr., car number one, looking perhaps at two in a row here in Denver, but there is a great deal yet to come. We'll be back. Andretti, you see him at the back of the order as the pace begins to pick up. His job will be to cut through all of those in front of him. Come up to the front and do battle with that man. Car number one, Al Unser Jr. Emerson Fittipaldi comes to the line in second. Eddie Cheever is third. And then Michael Andretti as the green flag comes out once again with 56 of the 70 laps complete. Well, you can watch little Al right there at the start. He, he lost it a little while ago to Michael. He lost that lap. He's dead serious now. He, at that start, he really got the jump. He's going to take off and try to put some distance on Michael to get his insurance policy back again, Paul. The five-car Emerson Fittipaldi has his closest competitor, Eddie Cheever, just behind him. And if he is to stay in contact with the leader, he has to get around his own teammate, Rick Mears, and Scott Pruitt, who sat just in front of him. Yes, the guys are all giant or buying really hard for position right now because the starts is where you gain the most. But it's usually where you have the most problems as far as small accidents go. Cheever is staying right there with Emerson Fittipaldi as Fittipaldi and Cheever come by Pruitt and now have only Rick Mears to handle up if they're going to get back in touch with the leader. And I suspect as soon as Rick sees that it's his teammate behind him, he will be very careful about giving way to that following car. The drivers have all seen each other at close quarters throughout this race and have a good idea what the other strengths and weaknesses are. So they've made book. There it comes. The pass by Emerson Fittipaldi of his teammate Rick Mears. A nice clean pass as you might expect between two intelligent teammates. And Mears slides in just ahead of the combatant with Fittipaldi, Eddie Cheever. But Mears did try to give him some racing room as they came through the corner. He comes wide again. And Eddie Cheever really tried to get in there along with Ammo because he knew that there he got him. Eddie Cheever's got him, but Scott Pruitt really had to get on the brakes for that maneuver as Rick got into the corner just a little to let Cheever have the position. Well, as soon as we saw the smoke come up the front tires, we thought, well, there's going to be another wing gone, another front wing. At the same time, over Whoa. on the inside, Willie T. Ribs and Scott Pruitt are at it, and they are also, by the way, racing for position. They are racing for fifth place, though a lap down from the leaders of the race, so that is a battle as well. Right now, Scott comes inside of Rick Mears, and that battle breaks off for the moment. Scott Pruitt runs up right behind Eddie Cheever, who is, in fact, the third place car at this moment. Eddie Cheever's brother Ross, by the way, who lives in Japan, 
and races in Formula 3000 is in the pits watching Eddie today and I think hoping that maybe he will see a ride in the Indy cars very shortly. At the top of the order, it is still Al Unser Jr., then Fittipaldi, then Cheever, then Michael Andretti is now trying to work his way up through this field. Well, Michael's having a lot of traffic to go through, and he's having a hard time with it. You know, the racetrack is slippery, the tires have been abused very hard, it's just hard to pass these cars that fast. Yeah, but look how far he's come, as Michael is now right up behind Rick Mears, and have already passed some of, uh, well, a good number of cars, because he started in the back of the order. So Michael Andretti, perhaps the fastest car on the circuit at this moment. Interesting as we saw Rick Mears deferring to another driver. It's funny how very different the races are one to another in this kart series. Only a couple of weeks ago we saw Rick Mears just dominating the race at Michigan, the big 500 mile race on the big bank track. Now of course, very different kind of competition and in order to win the championship, the car championship, you must truly be versatile. Michael Andretti driving for all he's worth now as he works his way up through the field. Gary Gerald, you have an update. Well, Paul, one of the reasons Michael might be making that progress through the traffic, he darted in just before the green came out, got a half turn on the right front wing, trying to affect the handling characteristics of the car. Apparently, it's responded well for this stretch run. Remember, just minutes ago, he was a lap down, and they were just biding time trying to collect points. Now they think they've got a shot to possibly still get up and challenge. Eddie Cheever just turned in a blistering lap at 92.9 miles an hour, a full mile an hour faster than anyone else at the top of the racing order here. So there is Cheever as he's flying. Just behind him is Pruitt, and just behind him is Michael Andretti. As Michael comes up to challenge Scott Pruitt, and now Michael Andretti is in direct contact with third place all the way from the back. He is now just behind Cheever and carving his way up. Now let's always keep in mind yellow flags, any yellow flag. Even though Michael's on the same lap, he's just about to pass. He's just oh. about to pass Cheever there. He made contact close. again. Michael, driving for all he's worth, comes right up and taps at the back of Eddie Cheever's car. Well, we know Michael still has a chance to win this race. It's just totally possible. He just can't drive any harder. It's typically the same way he's driven all year. He's really chasing it hard. And the point is, if you think he's being too aggressive, hey, wait a minute, take a couple of laps to get by Cheever. He can't afford to do that if what he's thinking is win. He's got to get by Cheever now, and that's why he gambled as much as he did. But, Sam, you can't say Eddie Cheever's giving it up. Boy, look at that Eddie. I've never seen Eddie Cheever drive this hard, hard since he's been in kart racing. Eddie Cheever definitely can hustle a car, is doing so now as both of them are traveling incredibly fast around this circuit. Michael closes in, Eddie Cheever protects the line and remember this is a point in the race on a very hot day in Denver in which their brakes are definitely fading. Their tires aren't as hearing as good as they can so anything that they do when they run close like this has a certain very certain element of danger. Of course. Now of course Michael no longer has the element of surprise. He's trying him down there on the inside. They come in, they lock on. together, they almost tend. He, oh. That was incredible. Great both cars by totally both locked up there. Yeah. Both oh. totally locked. Remind you of going to a Saturday night midget race. The guys are running these race cars, these Indy cars, I think harder than we've ever seen on a street court. Bumping, a little bit of banging, and it's been going on constantly all day. Michael Andretti was willing in that maneuver to put his fate in the hands of Eddie Cheever. He took that chance. That's what winning the race means. You, there are times when you just can't wait indefinitely for something to happen, an opportunity to open up. So he just drove down inside, and if Eddie Cheever had just turned into him, that would have been it for both of them. And now with just 10 laps in this race to go, perhaps most important for Michael Andretti, he's picked up two more points and is now only nine behind Bobby Rahal. But now he has his sights set on Emerson Fittipaldi and Al Unser Jr. Little Al leads the race, Fittipaldi is second. It's a good idea on how things can change and how a driver should, or an athlete should just never give up. It looked earlier in the day like Michael was totally out of the picture, gonna finish somewhere way back in the pack, and right now he's in second place, and Little Al, believe it or not, is worried about it coming up. Well, Sam Posey, you mentioned it right at the start. He's made his announcement. He knows, knows where he's going to be for another year. Even as important, the team knows that they're all going to be together for another full season. And that buoys the spirit. Even though he went well down with the problems that he's had, here he is back battling in third place. Well, exactly. I talked to his wife, Sandy, and I said, well, you know, will this help him to concentrate even more on the races now that he doesn't have the pressure of all those transatlantic negotiations going on? Here's Sandy here. She said, 
geez, more concentration at the races? That's impossible. He already concentrates 100%. If I want to talk to him, I have to hit him over the head with a 2 by 4 But the point is, the team around him now realizes he's going to be with them, not just through the rest of this year, but all next year. So it's not a lame duck last few uh, races, and I think that makes a tremendous difference. At the moment, none of the cars in the top of the order are in contact with one another. Allen's her junior legion. Emerson Fittipaldi is trying to close, as is Michael Andretti. But Allen's her junior is setting a blistering pace with the full course yellows. He's not running as fast as he did last year. The average only 68.4 miles an hour. But still, he is pulling away from the rest of the field. Fittipaldi, you just get a glimpse of him there, is closing in and trying to catch up on that number one car. Allen's her junior, well, he's looking at a very possible two races in a row, winning the only two races ever held here in the downtown of Denver, Colorado. Let's go back. This is uh, when Michael Andretti was closing on Eddie Cheever. Well, that was the target just in front of him. He's very lucky that he didn't suffer uh, suspension misalignment there. Well, that both of them were able to keep the thing under control. Yeah. You wonder sometimes how many times they can do that. Yep. Levity's locked yep. up and brakes yep. totally going in. You can even see as the tire gathered up the other rubber from the racetrack. And look at how quickly he counterattacked, too. He did not let that contact put him off. Just half a lap later, he made the move that carried him through. Michael Andretti, perhaps by driving the finest drive of his life, in third place, trying to catch Emerson Fittipaldi. The leader of the race is Al Unser, Jr. It's been a long, hot afternoon here in Denver, but this race is most definitely not over yet, with those first four cars still battling with one another. We'll be right back. It's in Fittipaldi, and Fittipaldi has turned the last couple of laps just a tiny bit faster than Al Unser, Jr., though that last lap turned in by both at 88.6 miles an hour. But little Al is very definitely aware that Fittipaldi is there. Don't forget, coming up next, there's more speed and endurance on the roadways in Watkins Glen, New York, as the world's finest auto racing legends come together for the final round of the International Race of Champions. That's the round that, of course, determines the overall champion. This is Tony Bettenhausen with a really brilliant run here today. Doing a nice job. Runs in 10th place. Let me run through the top of the order as we watch Tony for you. Allen to Jr. Bit of Faulty Michael. That's a given. Eddie Cheever. They are all on the same lap. One lap down is Scott Pruitt and Willie Ribs. Then John Andretti. Then Rick Mears. Then Buddy Lazier. And then Tony Bettenhausen rounds off the top 10. Followed by John Jones, Jeff Andretti, Jeff Wood, Hiro Matsushita, and those are the cars that are all running at this moment. Surprisingly enough, most of the field within one or two laps of the leader and four cars running with this man, Alan Zer Jr., the leader of the race. It says, by the way, on the side of the cockpit, just near where Alan Zer Jr. is sitting, it says, visit New Mexico in very small letters. So he is pr promoting his state, as you see Emerson Fittipaldi closing in or maintaining station behind him. You know, I think one of the significant things that we are seeing today is there are two really great young road course drivers in this country right now. Alan Sir Jr., Michael Andretti. We've seen a great confrontation between them today. Obviously, we expect to see a lot more of this. Both men are committed to this series. We're going to see, as fans, there's a lot to look forward to in the next few years. One thing that this race certainly does is brings out the possibility of tourism here in Denver. As we pointed out, a race downtown like this is very difficult. This is right in the center of Denver, right in front of the state capitol building. It takes a great deal from a city and state administration to be able to pull something like this off. While they're thinking of moving it, I think all of us hope that they don't. Well, I kind of wish they didn't do, Paul, but I think they're going to. Here's a guy right here, Emerson Fittipaldi, who is just as stubborn a race driver and a harder charger as I've ever seen. Now, he's trying very hard. We know his brakes are not really good, and he's trying very hard to get up on little Al, and he's going to push him, trying to break him right now. That's his whole idea, is to push him so hard that he makes a mistake. He has one road course win to his credit this year. That was in Detroit, a course a lot like that, this one. He's been second twice on similar courses, both times behind Michael Andretti. Well, Alenzer Jr. runs in front with Fittipaldi there. In fact, little Al just got around the 86 car of Jeff Andretti, putting a bit of a separation. This was just a few seconds ago as Rick Mears lost some braking as Cheever turned in alongside Lazier and took the left front uh, wing assembly off of the car. Lazier was able to keep rolling down the track. Obviously, he's not injured, but some tight racing in that situation. 
with Cheever and Rick Mears. Cheever was looking at Mears and not at Lazier, an, uh, an understandable error, but that turn once again has claimed uh, another victim. Other winners here at Denver in the Indy Lights, P.J. Jones, Herb Hare won in the Trans Am, and in the Escort World Challenge, Doc Bundy took the win. A special thanks to Fran Leonard, John Leonard, Jeff Dickerson, Greg Fielding, and Jeremy Shaw, who have helped us with the statistical information here in the booth throughout all of our ABC races this year. Now running right with the leaders, 12th place, Jeff Andretti. He's the one difference in an Andretti helmet. He has that big J on his helmet. He's an individualist. Otherwise, we can't tell the difference. <laughs> Emerson Fittipaldi. There you see the distance between he and the first place car. Now with just four, four laps to go. Emerson, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Ayrton Senna, of course, won the... Uh, 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 Belgian Grand Prix today extending his lead in the world championship we thought that today if Bobby Rahal were to win this race we'd have a similar situation with a man way out front not so we now have a very very tight battle for the car championship with Bobby Rahal falling out not scoring a point here today it definitely closes the points fight up Roger Penske keeping track of his driver Fittipaldi as well as Rick Mears well you can watch that poker face on Roger Penske he just looks like He's motionless. He doesn't have any motions at all. It's all business with Roger. His racing is probably the most serious of all the businesses that he's involved in. Ellinger Jr. won here last year. On his way to victory now in the closing laps of this race. What has been a hard-fought battle for most of the competitors has, in fact, for Little Al, been a fairly smooth run. Well, it has been a smooth run, except that... Uh, Michael getting that free lap back. Emma all of a sudden getting a new breath of fresh air and pushing as hard as he can. I don't think he's ready for that, Paul. Well, taking a look at these statistics, Al Unser Jr. certainly is a master on the streets, and Michael Andretti does very well as well. What Al is able to do that so far Michael has not been able to do is run these races without making contact with anybody at all. Look at his car. It's completely clean. He has a real knack for taking chances when they pay off the most and not getting involved when they are not going to pay off. An update on Little Al. Here's Jack Aroot. Paul, you're talking about what an effortless run it's been for Al Unser Jr. Probably the closest call came on that aborted start. He reported back to Rick Gallus and the crew that he literally got drop kicked on the start, but it didn't seem to cause any problems throughout the day. Well, it certainly didn't, Jack, and you can see by the marks on his car, but we saw that that almost ended up being a big crash into that first turn of the people that didn't see it. It almost being, ended up being just like a junkyard of Indy cars down there because the track was blocked for a while. Don't forget that throughout the season, there has been an ongoing pit stop competition. Not only will today's pit stops help determine the eventual winner of the event, but they'll also help to determine the final outcome of this year's $135,000 Texaco Haviland pit stop competition. And assuming that in the next two laps, no one makes a stop, which is certainly not likely, Rick Mears will have scored 102 points and picked up 40 $6,000 for the team. Allen's or Junior's team in second with 57 points and $33,000. And Michael Andretti's team with 56 points will pick up $24,500. That's the Texaco Haviland pit stop contest, which is final as the checkered flag comes out. Allen or Junior driving, picking up a point for driving the most and leading the most laps here in this race and looking for 20 points as the winner. Sometimes you can see the driver's emotions mirrored in the way his wife looks in the timing stand. And as we looked at Shelley Unser a moment ago, she was actually laughing. I think circumstances like this have become so familiar in that family. You think of the big lead, very similar situation that we had earlier this year at Long Beach. I think there's a lot of feeling that once little Al gets out ahead, he is able to do what it takes to stay ahead. Even so, you see how close behind him right now Emerson Fittipaldi is. Emerson Fittipaldi comes around Matsushita. By the way, that's the pronunciation that now Hero himself has asked all the announcers to use. We know it's not the same pronunciation that the family uses or he uses in Japan, but it's what he wants. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Quick update on Emerson Fittipaldi, Paul. The brake temperatures from the telemetry that they have in the pits here indicate that those temperatures continue to rise in the late stages. Emerson has been doing a remarkable job, they feel, stalking Little Al as he has in these final laps, but the temperatures keep going up, and that means the effectiveness of those brakes has to keep going away. 
and we got a good example of that as Emerson spoke the tires, even as you were talking, Gary. It just shows, Paul, that, that no matter what, if Emo had to try to pass it allow right now, he'd have to do it under braking, and he just doesn't have enough rear brakes to do it. He can keep up a little out, but he can't seem to do it with the braking. Which so means, Alex of course, Jr. That he would have a very hard time overtaking him. Uh, tactically, he's in a very weak position. White flag has been given to Little Al. Fittipaldi trying to close in. He's closed down considerably in the last two laps. He was back 2.9 seconds behind. Now he is just two seconds last time they came across the line. And Fittipaldi is most definitely closing in. He never quits. He's just like a bulldog. He's about one of the hardest charges that we have in racing today. The hardest charges, and he just won't quit. He won't quit until he goes across the finish line wherever he is. And one of the finest gentlemen in the sport, hoping to open an IndyCar circuit down in his home country of Brazil you know, in the next couple of years. You know, physically, Paul, he's probably in the best shape of any of the drivers here. He works out almost every day. Emerson Fittipaldi chases Al Unser Jr. to the final turn of this track, but the checkered flag will be waiting for a little Al as Fittipaldi slides it off the final corner, and here comes Al Unser Jr. with back to back wins in Denver. Al Unser Jr. has taken the win. It means that we will leave here with Bobby Rahal still leading the points with 141, but Michael Andretti with a third place finish has closed up to 132 points. Just nine back from Al Unser Jr. who now has 129 points. So that's the top of the order. Al Unser Jr. takes the win. The race has run just a little bit long. We're not going to be able to... No. Mario Andretti at Alcart Lake, Gordon Johncock at Atlanta, Teo Bobby at Pocono, Tom Sneva at Indianapolis and Milwaukee, Al Unser at Cleveland, Bobby Rahal at Riverside, and John Paul Jr. at Michigan. Rahal is the most recent winner on the road course at Riverside, and he broke the track record here this weekend and will be starting from the full position in today's escort radar warning 200 from Mid-Ohio Sports.